Okay, here we are, Adrian, but potentially our final installment of a four-part series that we didn't know was even going to be a series. <laughs> a surprise series, the best kind yeah, of series. A surprise series. This started several episodes ago from a user-submitted question, which sparked very not random episode 32, covering the 10 general physical skills, which is one of the models of fitness from the What is Fitness article that Greg Glassman wrote all the way back in October of 2002. Great episode number 32. We then figured, hey, let's keep going. Let's discuss all the models. In episode 34, we covered the hopper. In episode 35, the metabolic pathways. And now here we are going to cover the final installment, which is the sickness, wellness, fitness continuum, which if you're reading the CrossFit Journal article, just because I love to have you know factual information here. If you're reading the, the article from 2002, it states that there are three models of fitness, and it doesn't really count the sickness, wellness, fitness as a fourth model, but it says that it helps support the overall definition of fitness we're trying. But if you've recently attended a, a level one, or heard the What is Fitness lecture, it's presented as the fourth model. And, and personally, if I may, I think it fits very nicely as a fourth model. Yeah, me too. I, I would agree with that. I think that um, as the hopper kind of grounds a lot of these other physiological and uh, kind of list of attribute style models of fitness, like the 10 general physical skills and the uh, metabolic pathways, the, the hopper grounds those in reality. What can you do? How do you do on all these different tests? What does that look like on average? Can you claim to be fit because of that? The sickness, wellness, fitness continuum does the same thing for basic metrics of well-being. So you can, you can take a look at some of these other models and say, okay, that's all good and well for in the gym, but what's going on under the hood of the human animal that chooses to train like this? And is it supported by a healthy outcome? And I think that's an important thing to consider because it's not always as obvious. You know, sometimes you can be snowed by somebody who looks amazing uh, on the cover of a magazine or whatever, but if you actually were to poke around on their health profile, you might not be so satisfied with the outcome there, even though they look the part on TV, so to speak. It, this is actually how you previously said that the hopper might be your favorite model. I think this is my favorite model. Oh, cool. Yeah, believe it or not. And I think it is because it was not when I first got into CrossFit. Let me go ahead and, and say that. But you've mentioned it in some very kind wording in previous episodes uh, about how we're getting to be more senior, if you will, and, <laughs> and how our, our perspective has changed to like down the road and long term health and fitness and, you know, saying yes in your 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. I think the sickness, wellness, fitness continuum really encapsulates that as well of, of me wanting to make sure that I'm doing what I'm doing inside the gym and outside of the gym. So I'm going to have this long, happy, healthy life. And if I'm not paying attention to some of these markers that occur in the 23 hours a day I spend outside of the gym, I'm doing myself, I think anyway, a disservice to such a substantial degree that cannot be undone no matter how hard I work in one hour in the gym. And so I think this is, you know, either the silent killer or the silent ally that is really helping you kind of get to that next level of your of your long term health and fitness. Yeah, I think that's true. So it's interesting that old man Sherwood is, uh, <laughs> is not concerned with the uh, the sickness fitness continuum, whereas young man Sherwood maybe not so much. But but nah, I think just that's, the leaderboard man wanted yeah, the leaderboard. Right, yeah. <laughs> I think that's a natural progression. But um, what's interesting about that is that the two do follow one another, and that's the good news. The good news is that with a, enough breadth of training and uh, development of a, a total fitness like like we advocate for, you are going to see a lot of benefit on this sickness uh, continuum. So let's, why don't we break it down a little bit? Because I think sure. for a lot of people, it can be um, conceptually a little bit weird when you start digging into this, but it doesn't have to be complicated. And so basically what we have here is this continuum where on one side of the um, graph or drawing, whatever you want to call it, we have a state of being sick. Now, no, we're not talking about like an acute illness, like catching a cold or something like that, but we're talking about a, a permanent kind of chronic sick state. 
And if we move away from that, um, we're going to have a state of wellness, meaning that we've got a collection of health markers that would point to us being generally well. We're not turning heads with our amazing vitality or anything like that, but we're not in a place where there's lots of risk either. What's perceived and, as normal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Just kind of average. And if we keep moving down away from that further along this continuum, we have the ultimate end state, which is fitness. And that means I've got this nice collection of health markers that we indicate that I'm much above average. And I'm not only not at risk of falling into this sick, I've got this big buffer before I even get to a state of normalcy. And that's the benefit of fitness. So you could take any number of health markers and kind of plot them along this. You know, body fat's a really easy one to, to make the concept real. So if we took an individual and let's say they had 40% body fat, most people will agree that that range is generally unhealthy. It's going to be associated with mm -hmm. a lot of adverse effect. Um, so that's going to be plotted on that side. Now, let's say we take that individual and we say, hey, look, 40% is not where you want to be. And they say, okay, great. How can I change this? They make some lifestyle changes. They start getting um, some things in order. You check back in a year later, and now they've dropped down to 25, 20%. Pretty remarkable change. But that's still not going to place us in that fit zone. They'd be probably around that well, kind of average. Like, mm -hmm. hey, all right, 20% body fat. It's not amazing, but you've moved yourself away from that risky zone. So now that individual is not satisfied. They say, okay, I've made some good progress. I'm down to 20% body fat, but I want to keep going. And let's say years down the line, they're sticking to it. They're dedicated. Diet's in order. Lifestyle's looking good. You come back four or five years later, and this individual is 10% body fat. It's a pretty remarkable transition from 40 to 10, but you know, let's let's say that it happens. Right. That individual can now say that for that health marker, they're in that fit range. Things are looking way above average. It's moved them so far away from risk as to create this buffer before they ever get back to normal. And that's ultimately what we'd want to do with a lot of these health markers. It could be blood pressure, bone density, muscle mm -hmm. mass. You know, all of these different things that your doctor is going to have acceptable ranges for uh, can be plotted along this continuum. And I think that's it. You know, we could we could put specific numbers there, and and they do. You know, if you go to the seminar or whatnot. But hey, pick your favorites, right? Talk to your physician. Do a little research yourself. If you, you know, if you thought Adrian was a bit crazy with what his body fat percentage numbers were, like you, you could find some that we could generally agree in them. And like you said, triglycerides. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And what I love about this model is, I think it gives, if you're following this, I think it gives you one of the most precious resources on the face of the earth, which is time. That They always used to say that if you think about this, where you've got fitness all the way on one side, sickness on the other extreme, and in the middle is wellness or normalcy, that if you're living your life on the fit side, with all of your markers wonderfully placed over there, you're not going to go from 10% body fat immediately to 40%. You're going to have to pass yep. through 12, 15, 17, 18, 20, 22. Basically, it gives you time to assess like, whoa, hey, what's happening? I, I'm not moving in a good direction. But by the time you went from 10 to 12 to 15 to 17 to 18 to 20 you're still in what's considered normal. You're still in a range where your physician's still going to give you a high five on the way out the door and tell you to keep up the yeah. great work. But in your mind and the way that you live your life, you know that something isn't going the right direction. And now you have, again, that wonderful resource of time to figure out what has changed in my life, be it in the gym or mm -hmm. outside of the gym, that is starting to have this, this negative effect in this one particular area. Figure out what it is get the make a rudder adjustment if needed correct course and get back on track whereas if you're living your life in normal in a 20 25% well your next step is to sick we well, don't want your next step to be sick it's great when you're fit your next step is to normal and if mm -hmm. you're living your life in that sick category well, then your next step might be in the emergency room or some sort of actual critical care because you have not given yourself any buffer, any wiggle room, any forgiveness at all. So that's what I love about this. If you're living your life 
with the goal of being in that fitness area, you have time and time mm-hmm. is time is what you need to to figure it out. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, to extend the analogy, I think about it like a bank account. I mean, if I am riding the line of of a zero balance in my bank account and I lose my job, I mean, that's a dire circumstance cuz I don't know how I'm going to make rent, I don't know how I'm going to pay for my lifestyle, all that kind of stuff. But I've got a million dollars banked just hanging out waiting for me for a rainy day and I lose my job or I I no longer have a stream of income. You know what? I'll find another one. It's not that big of a deal. I've got time. And it's exactly like you said. So yeah, creating that buffer, I think is critical. And and it especially speaks to more holistically, this idea of what are we training for in the first place? We're training for the events and and, um, actualities of of life. There's going to be some bumps along the road. You're going to have times where, you know, things fall off a little bit due to circumstances outside of your control or just uh, just changes. Um, perfect example, you know, I mean, you just had a, uh, a daughter and uh, it hasn't been a super smooth ride so far. <laughs> no, it has not. <laughs> Cer- certain things, uh, you know, have to give way to new responsibilities. And, you know, that could probably result in a little bit of a back tick in some of these things. But because you've been doing what you're supposed to and you had your ducks in a row and everything's looking pretty good, You've got that buffer. It's not that big of a deal. This is what you've been training for. And so in effect, it's like you're allowed to tap into this resource that you've been accruing over time. And that's so powerful when things aren't always stacked in your favor. And I think that's something that's overlooked a lot of the time. I agree. And in the article, you know, obviously a a key point of what we're talking about, the health markers that we've been discussing, you want those to move in the right direction. Don't get me wrong squatting, deadlifting, thrusters, pull-ups, intensity will all be your friends. But a large part of that also is going to be, again, those decisions you make outside the gym. How's Mm -hmm. your sleep? How's your diet? How's your stress levels? The diet is going to be a huge factor in this. And straight out of the article from 2002, uh, Greg wrote, done right, fitness provides a great margin of protection against the ravages of time and disease Where you find otherwise, examine the fitness protocol, especially the diet. Fitness is and should be super wellness. Sickness, wellness, and fitness are measures of the same entity, and a fitness regime that does not support health is not CrossFit. So again, constantly varied, functional moves at high intensity, but then they have to be supported with the diet and lifestyle that will move not just your Fran time in the right direction. And, and if your Fran time is improving, it's a very good indicator that you're making some smart decisions outside the gym. But yeah, exactly. make, make sure that the diet is going well also because as we talked about before we clicked on the camera here, it's interesting that we have to say this every now and then because some things that are now potentially just assumed as general knowledge, that was not always the case. And this article written in 2002 was in a time where a lot of these ideas were contrarian and revolutionary and went against the grain. And back then in 2002, there were many experts, if you will, or big um, fitness organizations that actually separated health and fitness and believed that Mm -hmm. you could be fit and actually not have great health markers. And that didn't sit well with Greg, didn't sit well with the CrossFit ethos or whatnot. And some of those classic observations were getting back to what we spoke about as defining fitness where people thought that endurance athletes ruled the roost well look at this guy you know this man or woman great endurance athlete but ravaged by some sort of illness or cancer or had a heart attack and truth be told they probably weren't making some of the best decisions nutrition wise outside of the gym as they could have been to support a healthy lifestyle Well, and what's interesting is if we go back and we talk about the breadth of fitness that we're really trying to develop, you know, it's um, very similar to the breadth of health markers that we want to see move in the right direction. It's not a singular data point that is of interest. It is the constellation of results moving. And um, you're going to see an interesting phenomena when you do what you're supposed to be in the gym, which is a lot of variance, uh, well applied. Um, and what I'm kind of dancing around here is this idea that 
just like we cannot claim to be the fittest person by only being good at one thing, we can't claim to be healthy by only having one metric that looks really outstanding. And you're going to see a lot of overlap between the two of them. And I'll give you a few examples. You know, if we isolate one, let's say something like um, muscle mass. And you know, it's pretty accepted that as people age, their muscle mass, total muscle mass, tends to decline. That's not news to anybody who's paying attention. But let's say that you're engaged in doing CrossFit and your deadlift increases. And maybe it's just a modest increase over the course of 10 years of training. Mm -hmm. You continue to increase that load, even if it's not turning heads from a powerlifting perspective. Well, guess what? It's, it's highly unlikely that that increase in deadlift, however modest it may be, is also going to be uh, uh, included with a decrease in muscle mass. That's, it's almost impossible to have right, that happen. Right. Um, which kind of leads me to my next point of, okay, so that's great. We can see this kind of one-to-one -one relationship, but what about that outlier athlete that you were talking about, the endurance athlete that has a couple of these well-established um, physical attributes and probably a couple of well-established health markers? Do we have enough information to infer that the rest of them is healthy? And the answer is maybe not. Mm -hmm. So if we think about our training and it's like, all right, we have that deadlift example. The increase in deadlift over time probably means that my muscle mass is doing pretty good. If I have that same thing happening with my Fran time, my 10K run, right. my ability to do muscle ups, my ability to do a, a rowing workout, my ability to hike, my ability to do all these things. If all of those physical things on, on a broad range are improving, it is going to be the best way to collect as many of these health markers and start to influence them in the right direction. Because it's entirely possible if you're only looking at one attribute that you might have one or two of those that are really, really good, but the other ones are kind of forgotten about. Okay. Your, your power lifter is another great example. You look at muscle mass, bone density, those guys are off the charts. I mean, they're, they're mm -hmm. among the best in, in the world when you look at those in isolation. But there's plenty of other health markers that you could probably point to that aren't going to be in such good shape if that's all that they're interested in. Resting heart rate might not be amazing. Blood pressure could be in the toilet. Uh, body fat percentage, even though you've got this amazing muscle mass, the body fat percentage that goes along with that might not be favorable. So you can see this kind of separation where certain attributes are heading in one direction and certain are heading in the opposite. And that's something that through a breadth of training, we can we can avoid to a lot of to a big degree anyway. The wonders of variance, once again, exactly, is, yeah. is you know not to as soon as you make you draw a line in the sand, you make a hard uh, opinion, you alienate people, people get upset. That's not my intention. So let me <laughs> let me preface this. But but if you didn't have variance in your program and you just squatted and deadlifted while you're doing amazing functional movements that you need to do for life, you could not necessarily be healthy from all these, you know, the blood work that your doctor would take, even though you have an impressive sure. squat and deadlift. And same deal if you're just running long every day. Well, it's fantastic that you're not sitting on the couch. I mean, and I mean that genuinely, but that shouldn't be confused with well-rounded health and fitness as well. But if you are doing a little bit of everything, which is again, the beauty of CrossFit programming from short to long, everything between lightweight to heavyweight, everything between gymnastics in there as well, with true variance, and all of those things seem to be going in the right direction, it's a really excellent indicator that, in general, you're making some smart decisions both inside the gym and outside the gym. I think that's another one of the, the hidden gems of CrossFit programming and the methodology, quite frankly. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's, it's really the big net so to speak. That's what we're interested in. What is and, the biggest net that's going to catch the most things and influence them in the right way? And another thing that was written in the original article in 2002, which I think is um, fitting these days, and we still find ourselves in the pandemic, right? And Greg wrote back in 2002, and it's, it's his words, not mine, a few sentences, so I'll read here. And this is the start of the sickness, wellness, fitness section in the What is Fitness article. He says, there is another aspect to CrossFit's fitness that is of great interest and immense value to us. We have observed that nearly every measurable value of health can be placed on a continuum that ranges from sickness to wellness to fitness. Tough to measure, we would even add mental health to this observation. 
Depression is clearly mitigated by proper diet and exercise, i.e. genuine fitness. So clearly not saying that, hey, if you just work out every day, you're not going to have any, you know, um, mental hardships <laughs> going on. So please don't. That's all it takes. Yeah, right. Please don't misinterpret <laughs> what I'm saying. But, but, you know, with everything that's been going on in the world and some of the um, depression, anxiety, and mental struggles that it has caused in people, certainly some of those are require some sort of clinical intervention, and that should be sought out beyond a shadow of a doubt. But, but outside of that, you know, some of the most powerful things you can do to keep yourself functioning well between the ears is diet and how you're moving your body. And so once again, that classic cross of prescription lends itself to moving the needle forward, even in some areas that are potentially a bit difficult to measure, right? Such as yeah. mood and how you're feeling. So I think once again, that's, these are all aspects of why I love the sickness, wellness, fitness continuum so much. And I'll even unless you've got anything else, I'll end on this one other aspect of the pandemic, which I know can be a touchy subject. So I'm well, going to hold just, on before, before oh. you get there. Let me just pop Please. in this kind of jog my memory. I, I, I'm paraphrasing and I can't remember where I picked this up. But, you know, there's a lot of lip service given to um, kind of mind body these days and inferring that there's a separation mm. or implying that there's a separation between the two. And uh, again, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here and I can't remember who to give credit to, but basically the brain is an organ like all other organs and it will respond physiologically like all other organs to healthy things that you are engaged in. And so just because it might be our favorite organ and the most complex organ doesn't separate it from the realities of what is good for everything else within the system. So it's easy to forget that sometimes because you've got this complicated consciousness that you're carrying around, but hey man, at the end of the day, it's an organ and it's gonna be positively influenced the same way that your stomach, skin, heart, lungs, et cetera, are influenced. And I know it's anecdotal and I'm a control group of one, but I, I know for me personally, regardless of the loading in the bar, regardless of whether I PR or don't PR, whatever the clock says, the overwhelming majority of the time, no matter what kind of a day I'm having, I feel better after I work out. I mean, that that in and of itself for my personal physical and mental health is one of the reasons that I am dedicated every day to getting in the garage and getting after whether I want to work out or not, because afterwards, so worth it, 100%. I will second that every day of the week. There are many, many, many times where I'm like, ah, I just don't want to go and do it. I've got not enough time. I'm stressed about other things in my life. And I try to come up with the excuse to not work out. But when I do it, I never regret it. It's, yep. uh, it's, that's very much a constant. And the other thing I was going to say about the pandemic is, you know, what a hot button topic. Regardless of where you stand on any of the issues that are so polarizing these days, I feel very confident that, you know, you're heading into a pandemic. Like, let's rewind the clock a couple of years don't know the severity, don't know really much about it all, far more unknowns than knowns. If you look at the sickness, wellness, fitness continuum, would you rather enter that unknown in the sick category, in the well category, or in the fit category? Any day of the week, Crosser talks about the unknown and the unknowable. There was an unknown and unknowable that nobody saw coming, and I'm, I feel profoundly filled with gratitude that I entered that unknown to the best of my ability with as much of my life in the fit category as possible. And I'm sure there'll be something else one year, two years, 10 years down the road. And, and I hope to be in the fit camp as well, because I think it is one of the most preventative things that we can do, quite frankly. Yeah. And to bring it back to a theme that I always feel strongly about, and that's this, uh, this idea of kind of personal and physical freedom. Uh, you know, once you look at this model and you understand it, you can't help but come away with the fact that you have direct influence over a lot of this. Now, it's not to say that you can control every aspect. I mean, catastrophe can befall sure. any one of us. You know, there's Absolutely. Plenty, plenty of things that are outside of your control. There's no denying that. However, there's a whole lot of things that are within your control and you can influence and you can put yourself in a better position 
to face some of those things that inevitably will pop up. And, and so recognizing that and, and having kind of visualization behind that through models like this, I find to be really powerful, especially when you're having those days where you're like, I'd rather not go to the gym. You know, you can kind of have that in the back of your mind and be like, oh yeah, this is another deposit in that bank account that is going to pay off dividends later. Absolutely. And there may, you know, there may be things outside your control, right? We, you just don't know if you got something dealt in your genetic cards that hasn't yet reared its head yet. You, 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 you can't control that. But to the best of your ability, what you can control, you might as well. You might as well try to stack the deck in your favor to the best of your ability. And anything outside of that, it's in somebody else's hands. It's not in your hands, but you yep. do what you can. So yeah, that this is my favorite. My favorite of the four models. It's uh... a... <laughs> Take it from old man Sherwin. <laughs> <laughs> as, as more years go by, it, it fires me up. Uh, as I look, as I look down the road, I'm like, yeah, this is this is the path ahead, inside the gym and outside the gym, the sickness, wellness, fitness continuum. So it's been it's been one of the many powerful things from the What Is Fitness article that absolutely stood what I thought I knew on my head and just shook all the old thoughts out and and, and replaced some very powerful, potent ones in there. So absolutely. Again, if you haven't read the article, check it out. Go to Google, type in CrossFit Journal, What is Fitness? It was in October 2002. You'll absolutely love it. And again, for references, this is the fourth of the four model, four models. And the other episodes are very not random, 32, 34, and 35. So now that we've put a bow on this, as we always say, appreciate everybody listening in audio format. But do us a favor, go to the BTWB YouTube channel, go to this episode, and you've heard what we have to say and our thoughts, but we want to know what you think. That way everybody gets smarter and better and we share our experiences. What's your interpretation of this model? Now that we've got all four, do you see the big picture? Do you have a favorite? Do you have an idea for new content or a show? Let us know. We read all those things. We appreciate it. For Adrian Bosman, I'm Pat Sherwood, and we will see you next time.